Greetings, aspiring orthopedic clinical specialists. Uh, we are going to review the temporomandibular joint. From now on, we'll just say TMJ to make it shorter for everyone. Um, we're going to review the TMJ scenario at this point. So when we look at this scenario, right off the bat, we're told that we have a 27-year-old college student. Not just sure that a college student makes any difference, but anytime I, I am given an age in a scenario, I want to pay attention to it because age can not dictate diagnosis. But as we all know, there are certain diagnoses that occur in certain age groups and there are certain ones that are more prevalent or more likely in certain age groups. So I want to if, if I'm told someone is 77 or 87 or 17, we absolutely want to know that. So right off the bat, as I go through these scenarios, I'm a paper person. So that's something I highlight. I want to know that this is 27 years old, uh, that this patient's 27 years old. So we're given a mechanism of injury here. We, we're, we're told that they fell and they hit the right side of their jaw on the ground. So that means something to us if we're talking about TMJ. This is not just um, an insidious onset. This is trauma. So they fell. They hit their right side of the. They hit their their right side of their jaw on the ground, and of course now they have complaints of pain and and in the right side of their face and jaw. That obviously makes some sense. Um, and then they describe it. They said the pain is constant and it's seven out of ten. So we know that it's fairly intense. So I want to pay attention to that information. And then when we're told, if we're told what makes the pain better or worse. We really want to pay attention to that as well, because that could be something that we can use if a treatment or intervention question is asked. So here we're told it's worse during eating and chewing. And that kind of makes sense with our knowledge of TMJ. And then we're given information here. Then we're given objective information. So that first piece, I kind of separate these things in my mind a little bit. The first piece, we have why the patient is, is coming to therapy. And we have the patient reports of or, or the, the subjective history. Now we're getting into objective measurement. So after that, after I read this subjective piece, I might be thinking of, of some hypotheses, what I think is going on. Now we get objective measurements. So obviously we have to attend to these as well. So we're given mouth opening and we're told it's 30 millimeters. So we want to know our normal ranges of motion, especially for TMJ. So if it's not something that you treat or you're familiar with, go back and review it, please. We want to know our normal ranges of motion. 30 millimeters, 30 millimeters is going to be short is going to be abnormally low. And we talk about a deflection to the right side. For TMJ, that means something to us. So it means when we open the mouth, it, it moves to the right side and then comes back to the middle. So that's really important. And we're given lateral excursion measurements as well. And we can see a difference between right and left. And then we're told that he has clicks during mouth opening and closing. So anytime we're given information like that with TMJ, that really is going to mean something to us. So we should be putting this information together this is a relatively short scenario, but we put this information together and we should be thinking about the conditions we're aware of with TMJ, which typically is, are we thinking about a disc or not a disc? That's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. We have some myofascial concerns as well, but this was due to trauma. So those, those are the first two thoughts I have in my head, disc or not a disc. Um, and then we kind of move on. And that's what our first question is. What's your pr primary hypothesis for the condition? And we're, we're given myofascial pain disorder. We're given two disc choices with and without reduction. And we're given a condylar fracture. So the correct answer here is a disc replacement with reduction. And that's where we have to know our knowledge of TMJ or possess the knowledge of TMJ. The click, the click gives us that information about that, that disc that when we open and we and that disc is anteriorly located, the disc relocates. And then when we close, it dislocates again. That's why we have an opening and a closing click here. So this is an anterior displaced disc with reduction. The click is the reduction. Um, for choice C, if, if we didn't get the click, that would be a disc without reduction because now the disc is not popping back over the condyle. So we're not going to get any sounds with that. And then the other two, myofascial pain disorder. Again, that would be more longstanding. We have other complaints of probably facial pain and more muscular complaints, which we do not have here. And a condylar fracture. A condylar fracture could certainly be in play here. It's an attractive distractor because we have trauma, but he can still eat and chew. He just has pain with it and he can open his mouth. If he had a condylar fracture, that would be very less likely, or his pain would be a lot less, even though it was seven out of 10, it would probably still be less or still be more. So it's, it's attractive because of the trauma. But when I look at the other pieces of information in this scenario, it's not the best answer. Um, when we look at these scenarios, when you look at these items, we're trying to give you challenging questions to ensure you know the material. So you may look at all four options and think, I think all four of these are correct. And they may be true, but there's one that's going to be a better answer than the other. So condylar fracture is attractive, but it's not the best answer here. So 
That's how we get to our anterior disc with reduction. And then we look at our next question. First step of physical therapy treatment for this patient. And we have a bunch of options here. We have one that just gives us a lot of modalities with some mobilization. We have one that talks about education, including posture. We have our isometric exercises to try and stabilize the joint. And we have some deep breathing exercises to relax masticatory muscles. When we look at this, all four of those may be decent choices to manage this patient. The best choice is B. We want to educate them about posture, tongue resting position. We want to be able to get into the neutral position of the TMJ. So that's kind of the first step in management with patients with TMJ issues. We want to be able to, to, to get them to get into that neutral position of the jaw. And then all other treatments can kind of follow after that. So that's what that's the, the key to, to this question. And it also gives them the empowerment of being able to self-manage. So that's the information we needed to answer that question. Now we look at question three. We're, we're given some progression. So now we're told that after a few weeks of intervention that he's improved. He can now open his mouth to 40 millimeters and his lateral excursion has improved as well. So now we've progressed. He still experiences the intermittent clicks with occasional catching. So that's information that I need to know to, to answer this question. And now we're asked at this time, which of the following exercises would be most appropriate. And we're given tongue controlled opening exercises, isometric exercises, condylar remodeling exercises, and isometric exercise for the cervical spine. Our best choice here is condylar remodeling exercises. Again, we need to be aware of what these exercises are. Um, they are exercises that are designed for when someone has a disc, um, a, a disc displacement. When we get that disc to reduce, we can do these exercises to try and hold that disc where we want it to be. So the best choice here is our condylar remodeling exercise. Some of those other choices, we talk about cervical spine, we weren't given any information about the cervical spine. So even though those two areas are closely related, from this scenario, that's not the best choice. And the other options we were given were a little too basic for where we are now, being that we're told that the patient has progressed. So condylar remodeling is our best choice here, our most appropriate choice. And now we're asked about in our fourth question, if we were going to recommend a splint for him to use at night, what would be the most appropriate option? So again, you have to have knowledge of TMJ and TMJ intervention and, and what these splints are used for. So we have a stabilization splint, an anterior repositioning splint, a nociceptive tridemal in inhibition suspension system. That's a whole big, long thing. And then we have a sport splint, which is basically like a mouth guard. Our best answer here is the anterior repositioning splint. The anterior repositioning splint is designed to hold the mandible in a position where once we recapture that disc and we do some of our condylar remodeling exercises, that splint goes hand in hand with that. It's designed to hold the mandible in a position that it keeps the disc where it's supposed to be. And then muscles are trained to keep it there. Soft tissues are stretched out. And that gives us the best um, the best progress or the best prognosis for for um, working with this this patient. So again, the other choice is a stabilization splint isn't necessary because if anything, he has hypomobility, not hypermobility. And a sports splint is just a mouth guard that's not going to do anything for to manage this case. And then the whole suspension splint that's not recommended because there are some controversial side effects with it. And um, we're also we don't have any trigeminal complaints in this instance. It's just jaw pain um, related to the trauma. So I think for a lot of people, TMJ is not an area that they treat a lot. So hopefully this scenario is really helpful. And if there was information in this scenario that you weren't aware of, for example, normal opening for, for the jaw and normal lateral excursion, that's information you definitely want to go back and review. And if there were some options here that you weren't aware of, again, hopefully you, you can go back and review that and capture that information. So hopefully this helped with our, with our knowledge of TMJ and TMJ management.